Well, we are looking at John's Gospel on a Sunday morning. And uh, <clears throat> last week in chapter 5, we saw the Lord telling people about the various witnesses that proved who he was, not just himself saying it, but what other people would say. He spoke about the miracles that he did. They witnessed to who he was. He spoke about God his Father and what he did about it and what John the Baptist had to say. And even the Old Testament scriptures, which all prove that Christ was the Messiah and the Saviour of the world. And this left nobody with any excuse not to receive him. But still people would not come to him that they might have life. And our Lord could see that the, the people who he was talking to didn't love God. And he told them that, you don't love God. And that's why you're rejecting me. Now this morning we're going on to chapter 6. And the passage before us is to do with the feeding of the 5,000. This is an event that is very well known indeed, but we hope that it will come to us today in a way that is fresh. The great miracle that was done on this occasion gives even more proof as to the deity of Christ. How could he feed 5,000 men and women out of next to nothing? But that's a picture of what God the Father is doing all the time every day. Even today he's doing that. Year after year, he's feeding all the people of the earth in such a wonderful way. This is the only miracle that Christ did that's found in all four Gospels. And that suggests that it is of outstanding importance and deserves our closest study. And no other miracle was witnessed by such a vast number of people as this one. More people not only saw it, but actually took part in it. When miracles were performed to heal the sick, things which had gone wrong were being put right. Things which were bad were being made good. But in this case, something was actually created which had not existed previously. The only other similar miracle was when our Lord turned the water into wine. And is it not wonderful that in creating the wine in chapter 2, and now creating the bread here in chapter 6, he's pointing out his own death on the cross. For when we take the Lord's Supper, we have bread and we have wine, the two things which Christ created when he was here on earth. The wine represents the blood and the bread represents his body, broken for us on the cross. Does this not show us once again the wonderful way the Bible has been put together by the Holy Spirit? All these things just fitting together. Now verse 1 actually tells us the time and place when this miracle happened. It happened after these things, it says. Referring us back to the end of the previous chapter where people have been very abusive against Christ and he had to tell them some solemn truths about themselves. Now that had taken place in Jerusalem. You remember that the pool of Beth says that the inside the gate of Jerusalem where all the sick people were, that was in Jerusalem. Now he's going to leave Jerusalem in the southern part and he's going to go up north to Galilee again. And we're told that he crossed over the Sea of Galilee. The point being that those people who had refused to accept him as their Messiah and the Son of God were now going to be put to shame by this great miracle that clearly showed that he was the Son of God. We're told that the Sea of Galilee was also called the Sea of Tiberias. This was the Roman name for it. It was named after the Roman Emperor Tiberius. And elsewhere we find that it had a third name, the Lake of Gennesaret. So here this piece of water, not all that big, call it a sea, 12 miles in length, 5 miles across, not huge, but in those three years that the Lord was here, amazing things happened on that sea, amazing things on that small amount of water. Now verse 2 tells us that a great multitude followed him, which sounds good, but alas they didn't follow him because of who he was. We're specifically told that they followed him because they saw the miracles that he'd done on those who were diseased. These people seemed to think that he was some sort of magician and they liked seeing spectacular things. And maybe some of them hoped to be healed themselves or maybe some of them hoped that their loved ones could be healed. 
But hardly anybody followed him because he was the saviour of sinners. And that's always been the case, even today. That people will go to churches where healings are supposed to take place and other such miracles, but hardly anybody goes to a church where Christ is preached as the saviour of sinners. Idle curiosity and the love of excitement attracts crowds of people. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. It would seem that he was trying to get away from the crowds and withdraw himself to a secluded place where he could be alone with the disciples. He never found any joy in being popular. Indeed, it was rather sad that so many people came after him, but so few people came to him. And when it came to fellowship, he'd much rather be with his own few disciples than with the, the thousands of unbelievers who sometimes flocked around him. Now we're told in verse 4 that the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Passover feast, I'm sure most of us know, celebrated that famous occasion way back in the Old Testament when God slew the firstborn boy in every Egyptian family, but when he saw the blood sprinkled over the homes of the Jewish families, he passed over, he passed over those homes and did not slay the boys there. And this is a great picture of the result of Christ, the Lamb of God, dying on Calvary's cross, shedding his precious blood. For whereas God will punish those people who have not applied the blood of Christ to their life, he will pass over the punishment of those who have applied the blood of Christ to their life. But the question here is, why are we being told this? Why are we being told this here? Why is it mentioned? It seems to be completely out of place. Well, the key word is the word feast. You see, Christ was about to perform a miracle to do with food, feeding hungry people, so he was going to make a feast, a huge feast. So this was a picture of the state of their souls, which were empty, but they refused to receive the blood of the Lamb. So he was going to feed them with bread and fish, but he could have fed them spiritually. He was the means of salvation and had come to these people, but they would sooner have what pointed to Christ, the Passover, than Christ himself. They would sooner have the Passover feast than have the Passover lamb. Now, although our Lord wasn't fooled by the multitude regarding why they followed him, he was concerned for them, and his heart of compassion went out to them. He was interested in their needs. So when they sought him out, he realised they were in trouble because they were miles from anywhere and they hadn't got any food to eat. And we're told that he lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come to him. Maybe his eyes were closed in prayer. Maybe his eyes were fixed on his disciples. But now they were lifted up and placed on those who were in need. Whilst Christian fellowship is a very, very wonderful thing, there are times when we need to lift up our eyes and see the needs of people outside, both their spiritual needs and physical needs. Although our Lord was fully aware of the failures of many of these people, he showed a great love for them and felt sorry for them. And those who got the love of Christ today will be the same. We know that the vast majority of people <clears throat> do not belong to Christ and don't want to belong to Christ, but that shouldn't stop us having some concern for them and showing a kindness towards them. Now what Jesus did next seemed rather strange, for he picked out one particular disciple, Philip, and asked him a question. And the question was, where shall we buy bread so that these people can eat? <clears throat> so this immediately placed Philip in a difficult position. But we're further told here that our Lord did this deliberately so as to prove him. He wanted to see what answer Philip would come up with because his answer would show some important things about him, especially about how much faith he's got. Philip had been at the wedding of Cana 
He'd seen the water turned into wine by the Lord. He should have learned from that that our Saviour has immense power and he's well able to do great miracles in order to supply people's needs. But unfortunately, not many people are strong in faith. And Philip was one of those. He wasn't strong in faith. And indeed, later on, when our Lord was about to feed the 4,000, he then asked the other disciples what they should do. And even though they'd taken part in this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, they still didn't come up with the right answer then. Just like Christians today, in their own lives. God has done great things for them, there's no doubt about that. He's got them out of difficult situations in days gone by. But when they're in an unpleasant position in the present, their faith is unable to apply God's goodness and greatness in the past to their new problem. And they can't always sing the words of that hymn with sincerity. His love in time past forbids me to think he'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. But just like our Lord put Philip on the spot so as to prove him, so he's doing the same with some of his followers today. In fact, all of us from time to time will meet up with a trying circumstance. And when that happens, we need to realise that this hasn't come about by chance. It hasn't come about by accident, but it's the Lord's plan so as to prove us. Sometimes a letter is received that plunges a Christian into sudden confusion. Sometimes a bill comes unexpectedly and needs to be paid. Sometimes a gadget at home breaks down. Sometimes a good friendship seems in danger of breaking up over some sharp disagreement. Maybe there's trouble at work or trouble at church or trouble at home. Or maybe their health starts to crack up. But whatever it is, it's the Lord's way of testing so as to see where that person's heart lies and how much faith they've got. And often the main purpose of the test is to see what our first response will be to the problem. That's how it was with Philip. What was going to be his first reaction to the problem? Was he going to look at his own resources to help him? Or was he going to look to the Lord? And it's surprising just how many real Christians tend to go for the human solution first when a problem comes along, instead of going to the Lord about it. We should all have learned by now to spread each difficulty before God as soon as it comes along. After all, what are our resources compared to God's resources? And what's our wisdom compared to his? He's promised to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. But can our faith hold on to that? We should be able to say, along with the psalmist, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. And remember that one of God's names is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And didn't our Lord teach that if God looks after the birds, he'll certainly look after us? Philip may well have thought to himself, why am I being picked out? Why aren't the other disciples being asked the question as well? But you see, this was his day, his special trial. Later on, when Peter was told that he was going to have a tough life in the future, he asked about John. What shall this man do? And he was told to mind his own business. Just because we're, we're part of a church and we're all called together in our service for God, it doesn't mean to say that we will all be treated alike. And sometimes, like Philip, we may feel that we're being picked out for a special trial but we have to leave that with God and try to respond in a positive way. Now we're told at the end of verse 6 that Christ already knew what he was going to do regarding his feeding of these people, so he wasn't asking Philip for his own sake. He didn't need Philip's advice. That sums up an awful lot of Christian work. God doesn't need our help. He can do just as well without us. Sometimes he uses us for our own sake, to help us. Or sometimes he's trying to deliver us from worldliness and give us something to do to stop that. 
Little did Philip realise that 5,000 people are going to be fed and he would have a part to play in it. An amazing thing. The Lord already knew what he was going to do, but for Philip's own sake, he included him and asked for his suggestion. And that's been remembered 2,000 years later. And what was Philip's suggestion? Well, we're told in verse 7, and it's rather a sad reply, he says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Bearing in mind that in those days, a man received one penny for a day's work, 200 pence was quite a large sum of money, and therefore we're talking about an awful lot of bread, assuming, of course, that they could find a bakery that could supply that amount of bread. And anyway, Philip knew well that Christ and the disciples between them didn't have that sort of money. Philip made the mistake of looking at the circumstances instead of looking at the Lord. He considered the size of the problem and not the power of his master. He was acting by sight and not by faith. And therefore, this was the language of unbelief. But he seems to have given it some thought, working it out, perhaps he was good at maths, working out the number of people, the price of bread, how many people per loaf, and he comes up with the lowest possible amount of money. But one word he used which was particularly sad was the word little. We wouldn't have sufficient an amount of bread even if we were to give every one of these people a little. He was speaking to the person who was all powerful for Christ never did little works, he did great works. He always helped people fully. He never gave them little, he never kept them short. We might well have thought that having seen the great miracles that had taken place before this, Philip would have replied, well, you can do it, Lord, I've seen you do it before, you can do this, you can feed these people. But I'm afraid that Philip was rather like those Christians today who tend only to look at things from a human, earthly point of view. However, Philip was not the only disciple involved in this business, for in verse 8 we're told about Andrew. And Andrew is described here as the brother of Simon. I wonder why that's included there. I wonder why that was necessary. Andrew had been a disciple before Peter. He, indeed, he had brought Peter to Christ. And yet Peter so far outshone his brother, both in zeal and faith, that it was as if Andrew tended to live under the shadow of his brother. You can get the same thing today, where those who've been Christians the longest are not necessarily the most zealous and faithful. Indeed, it has happened that the person who's only recently become a Christian later on outshines the very person who led them to Christ. Anyway, Andrew comes to Christ and he says to him, there's a lad here with five loaves and two small fishes. So to begin with, Andrew does well. He's showing concern for those 5,000 people like his master was. But then once again, he also lapses into the language of unbelief by saying, what are they among so many? How can we possibly feed all these people with just this tiny amount of food? Again, he was looking at the circumstances and leaning to his own understanding. How we see from both these disciples that even the best of Christians can be doubting and sceptical and even distrustful of the Lord. Just how many Christians there are who do well when it comes to living a good life, attending the church, giving a portion of their time and money to God and even working for God. But when it comes to the matter of faith, when it comes to believing that God is going to get them out of their troubles, they have quite, quite a little bit of faith. And yet it says in the Bible, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now some people actually believe that this lad here, who had these five barley loaves and two small fishes, was a vendor. Somebody went round selling food at these large gatherings. 
rather like you might get people selling hot dogs and roasted peanuts at football matches. To my mind, that's a travesty of the truth. It says nothing about that here. And the Greek word translated lad means a little boy who is probably only about seven or eight years old. I personally believe that this food that he had was given to him by his mother for his lunch. And little though he was, I further believe that he'd listened to the teaching of Christ and put his faith in him and either overheard the conversation going on about the food or he was spotted by Andrew who spoke to him about it and this boy had to make a decision either to eat the lunch himself or to hand it over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is a little picture from a little boy of the great decision that all people have to make either to hold on to their lives for themselves or to hand it over to Christ so that he can use it and be a, and it be a benefit to other people. What it also shows me is that not only are the lives of men and women changed when they are converted to Christ, but so are the lives of children changed when they are converted to Christ. Some people seem to have the idea that if a person is born again at an early age, although they will show more interest in the Lord and the things of Christ, their behaviour won't be any different. But nothing could be further from the truth. As we so often say, you cannot be a Christian without living the Christian life. And it doesn't matter how old somebody might be. If a young child is converted, then the Holy Spirit is within them and he will change them. Their outward behaviour will change for the better and they won't be like other children. Indeed, like this boy here, they will want to serve the Lord. And we should also notice the fact here that Christ will receive gifts from children and will greatly use them. There's a very lovely children's hymn, I don't know if you know it. Listen to these words. Two little fishes, five loaves of bread, five thousand people by Jesus were fed. And this is what happened when one little lad gladly gave Jesus all that he had. All that I have, all that I have, I will give Jesus all that I have. What wonderful words they are, aren't they? Lovely to see little children interested in the Lord, trying to be good and so on. Anyway, Christ decides to do a miracle and feed all these people, despite the unbelief of his disciples. And here we have confirmation that God is not tied down by our lack of faith. And he has sometimes blessed us and used us despite it. He tells his disciples in verse 10 to make the people sit down. And this was the test of their obedience. What was the point of sitting the people down when there was no food to give them? But it was not for the disciples to reason, but to obey. There's far too much questioning and far too little obedience. Perhaps George Muller, I'm sure most of you have heard of him. He ran a Christian orphanage in Bristol many years ago. Perhaps he remembered this event when he made all the orphans in his charge sit down at the dinner table and say grace. He knew there was no food to give them, but just after they said grace, a baker's van drew up outside the orphanage and there was plenty for all. George Muller didn't know that the baker's man was coming, but he'd asked God to send them food and he had the faith to believe that that's what would happen and it did happen. It had been rather the same when the disciples had been out in a boat all night fishing and had caught nothing. And our Lord told them the next day to cast their net over the right side of the boat. Common sense told them there's no point in that. But nevertheless they obeyed. That's the important thing. They obeyed and received a great number of fish because of it. It's always good to see those Christians who although battling in their lives against their lack of faith, they admit that, 
are still obedient. It's when somebody uses their lack of faith to be selfish and disobedient, you've got to wonder whether they're a child of God at all. You see, the description given of unbelievers is that they are children of disobedience. They're the children of disobedience. Therefore, it must be true of Christians that they are the children of obedience. Now, we're told that there was much grass in this place, and that made it more comfortable for the people to sit down. And although we don't realise that the Lord is often sending our way many different little comforts so as to make our lives more enjoyable. Now, of course, this ties up with the 23rd Psalm. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In fact, in Mark's account of this, you actually get the word green. It actually says green. The grass is green. Now, the first thing that Christ does with the loaves and fishes in verse 11 is to give thanks for them. And he sets us an example here, one which we should remember every day, to always say grace over our meals. The words are not necessarily so important as long as we mean them and we're truly thankful and we recognise God is the provider of our daily food. Having given thanks, Christ then gave the bread and the fish to the disciples and they distributed it to all the 5,000 people. Now we say 5,000, but if you were to read the account in Matthew's Gospel, it says 5,000 men besides women and children. So it would be a lot more than 5,000. It was when Christ gave the bread and fish to the disciples that the great miracle took place. Of course, it's beyond our understanding, but somehow he was able to multiply to an extraordinary degree that little boy's lunch so as to feed all those people. And as the disciples distributed the food, their doubts must have changed to amazement. Each one of them, on average, uh, feeding about 500 people. Where did it all come from, they must have thought. I like those words at the end of verse 11. As much as they would, as much as they would. They could have been left out, but it means that every single person had as much food as they wanted. It was all according to their appetite. What a lovely picture that is of Christians being fed from God's word as much as they would. Some received more of God's word than others because they got a greater appetite than others. And then in verse 12 we're told that all the people were filled. So they didn't get the little that Philip was speaking about. They got a lot. They were completely filled. And whilst these people were all eating, they dropped pieces of bread and fish on the ground. And our Lord gave orders to the disciples to go and gather all these fragments of food up. And they each took up a basket. And all, all the twelve baskets were filled. So here the Lord Jesus sets another example for his followers, one that's not very popular today. And that is that they shouldn't waste food. I don't suppose many people today would like to eat bread and fish that's been lying on the grass, but that's because of the incredibly high standard of living that we have today. Wouldn't even enter our minds. Much more food is wasted today than ever before in history, even though the government is trying to do something to stop it. People no longer believe those words from Matthew Henry, Willful waste brings woeful want, or to put it in today's language, waste not, want not. As the people looked at the twelve baskets full of food, they would behold even more what a great miracle had taken place. They started off with five little loaves and two small fishes. Five thousand people were, were fed to the full, and still they had a great deal more than they started off with. It reminds us of what the prodigal son said about his father's servants, that they had bread enough and to spare. Do you remember that? Bread enough and to spare. And that's like most Christians today, certainly in this country. Our Heavenly Father gives us enough and to spare. Not only are our necessities met, but we're given much more. 
Finally, in verse 14, we're told that all these people who had seen this great miracle then said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. In other words, having seen the wonderful thing that Christ did, they now believed him to be the Messiah. For who else could have done such a thing? However, it does not say that any of these people became his followers. Perhaps some of them did. But it was only a year or so after this, when Christ was crucified, when the people chose Barabbas and called out for Christ's death. Where were these 5,000 people then? But you see, there have always been people who believe that Christ is the Son of God. They even believe that he can do miracles, but they don't want to be his followers. Perhaps there's somebody like that listening this morning. You believe in Jesus Christ, but you've not yet received him as your Lord and Saviour. I hope you'll consider your position. I hope that all of us will take to heart the lessons from this great event so that we might show our appreciation both for our physical food and our spiritual food because it all comes from God and to him be all the glory. Amen.